Hello and welcome to this webinar. Um, this is Parallelism in Python. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Daniel Payton. Um, I'm the Intel Product Specialist here in Grey Matter. Um, so we're a software reseller and a cloud services provider that's been in the industry since 1983. Um, we work with over 400 partners and help businesses of all sizes with their business development and technical needs. We're an Intel software elite reseller. Um, so following this webinar, should you have any questions about licensing, anything like that, just please get in touch. I'm now going to pass over to uh, Stephen Blair Chapel from Baincore, who's delivering the technical part of this webinar, um, showing you how to implement parallelism and profile your Python code using the Intel software tools. Um, if you do any, have any questions, just save them towards the end um, and then we'll answer them then. Right. Um, so Stephen, over to you. Great. Thank you. And um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Stephen Blair Chapel. As, uh, as Dan said, I work for uh, Baincore. Um, in a previous life, I worked for Intel for 18 years in the compiler team, working with Intel customers, helping to optimize their code. So I, I, I come with this almost an Intel inside label. What I want to do today is to look at how you can get your Python code to be um, parallel and optimized. And I won't be looking at all the solutions today, but this, the plan is that this webinar will be one of a series. And um, today, um, I want to start off by just re reminding ourselves about the opportunities for parallelism in the architecture and then go on to show how using the Intel optimized libraries and the profiling tools, you can check that your code is um, taking best advantage of the architecture. Okay. As you probably know that you can look at the architecture in terms of what the parallelism is in different ways. So the first way that you might think of is that you've got a number of separate PCs connected together in a cluster. OK, and we'd call this uh, node level parallelism. OK. It's possible to get your Python code to run across a cluster of PCs, or, or if you've got a, a high performance computing environment, you might want to do that. Today, that's not what we're going to be looking at, but in one of the future uh, webinars, that's one of the topics of discussion. Um, there's a second um, way that you can think of parallelism, and that's thinking about what's on an individual CPU. OK, so here's your CPU and uh, you might have a, a CPU that's got four cores. And um, so this would be uh, the CPU and this is um, core level parallelism. And what we're going to be looking at today is in getting our Python codes and also confirming that the Python codes are running on the CPU at core level. If you use Python code out of the box, no optimized libraries and pay no attention to your optimization, chances are that you'll just be running on one core. What we're aiming to do is to be able to run the Python code on all our cores. So that's the goal. But there's also a third level of parallelism. And I'm going to move my sheet just a little bit up here so you can see it. Let's do that. Just get it so you can still see it actually giving a space. And that is um, something called data level parallelism. Okay, so level parallelism. And that's sometimes uh, called vectorization. And what happens here, there are two parts of the vectorization. First of all, there's some wide registers in each of the core, they've got a number of wide registers. Let's say this one is 128 bits wide. So that would fit two doubles in. Two. And uh, these wide registers can be used along with special instructions. So let's put an add. Okay, that's not the full name of the instruction, but what with a single instruction with data level parallelism, then a plus B could be done with one instruction. And what happens here is that, um, you know, A is in half of this register and the other uh, double is in the other half. And 
um, by using um, data parallelism or vectorization along with your core level parallelism, um, you should be able to see significant improvements in how your Python code is running. And that's what we're going to concentrate on today, mainly looking at core level parallelism, but I will be talking a little bit about vectorization. And again, in one of the subsequent webinars, we'll probably dig a little bit more into that. Okay, so with that, I'm now going to move back to my slides. So this is a, a slide which gives a more detailed view of uh, levels of parallelism. There's actually more in there, and I'm not going to talk about, there's actually seven levels there that you can look at from a programming point of view, but our focus today will be on CPU or, um, or core level parallelism and on the data level parallelism and vectorization. Uh, Python's very popular. I have to confess, I didn't used to use Python. Perl was always my language of choice. And then I think about eight years ago, I could see that Python was going in a different direction and I started using Python. And so now um, in a number of surveys, so this is one from uh, Kaggle, this is to do with machine learning and data science, that you see that Python is the main language. And in, in other uh, domain areas as well, Python is becoming very popular. It, it used to be that you'd get your Python code, do some prototyping in it, it's great for visualization as well, but if you wanted something to be optimized, you'd then convert that, translate the idea of what you're doing using another language. Uh, with the uh, developments in recent years, both in terms of optimized libraries and tools available, then it's quite possible to do all your design and implementation in Python and get something that's very close to the same performance you'd get using, for instance, a C compiler. And that's, we're gonna look at one of those techniques um, today. However, if you use Python out of the box and don't pay any attention to performance, what you'll find is that the Python runs slow on CPUs and also it's almost, it's very difficult to scale it um, either in terms of making the problem size bigger or uh, scaling across to using nodes. And, and so we're not gonna look at nodes today, that's for another day. But so without any, um, if you just use Python as it is without thinking about um, the different options available, your experience is the Python will run slow. And I'm gonna take you through some steps of taking a piece of code that's just written, uh, a very, fairly naive piece of code, running it out of the out of the box as it were on Python, and then going through a number of steps to optimize it. Um, one of the reasons for the performance bottleneck with Python is the global uh, interpreter lock of Jill, and that it serializes any Python execution. So if you're just using Python, you will not, um, it will not run parallel. It's purposely designed to run serial. But what you can do is that you can have, um, use other libraries underneath. So in this case, the, the Intel optimized libraries and using the, that are built with Intel compiler. And this can overcome the problems with the uh, lock. And what you'll see is that um, as we go through our example, that we're going to be relying on cores, uh, threads, and vectors. And these are the, the main areas um, where the Intel performance libraries bring performance to the Python. So what I'll be doing today and what you can do in your Python, the Python is standard Python. There isn't a special language, which is Intel's version of Python. It's absolutely standard. But under the hood, then the optimizations are brought about by introducing other libraries. And, and it's done um, silently. So you, you don't have to put a special pragma or, or piece of code or annotation in your thing to say, use the uh, Intel optimized libraries. No, as long as you start with the, with the Intel distribution, then those libraries are already there that they're, they're brought in and the, one of the key libraries for python is the intel math kernel library uh, which is uh, optimized both for the latest generation of cpus and also it takes into account the 
the, the architecture and layout of, of the system that you have. So what we're going to use today is that we're going to use the Intel distribution of Python, and we're going to use a tool um, called the Intel VTune Amplifier. I'll often just call it VTune. And that's a profiling tool, which you can profile um, either very finely, you can look at a lot of detail, or you can use it as a application profile where you're just looking for the main hotspots. And we, we'll be doing a bit of both. So we'll be having a sort of a high level view of the performance and then digging into the, uh, the details of what's happening. If you want to uh, use the Intel Python, the profiling tools, you, you have two choices. Um, if you're in an environment where you need um, to use also the Intel compilers, you need commercial, you need support and so on, then the Intel Parallel Studio is a complete um, set of tools. And I'll show you in the next slide what it contains. And that's a commercial product where you can get uh, priority support. And uh, for instance, you could contact Grey Matter and they'll, they'll show you the contact details at the end if that's um, the place where you're at. Um, there are also some parts of Parallel Studio that are available standalone, and, and it's mainly the performance libraries and the profiling tools. So the full Parallel Studio um, is here. So we've got three different versions, a composer edition, which is based around the compilers and the libraries. There's a professional edition, which adds some of the analysis tools. And then there's a um, a cluster edition. So if you're working on a cluster and using NPI, then there's additional library and tools to, to support that. If you're thinking of just using the community supported parts of, of Parallel Studio, then these are highlighted in the yellow boxes. So you've got the optimized libraries. So Math Kernel Library, there are some data analytics libraries, Intel threading building blocks and um, the Python. Um, all the profiling tools are also available. Uh, VTune, Inspector, and Advisor will be just looking at VTune today. If you're working on a cluster, then the MPI library is also available. What isn't available is this, the compilers, C and uh, Fortran compilers. And also, if you're on a cluster, then the profiling tool, the Trace Analyzer Collector, and also the Cluster Checker are not available as a community supported tool. So as I say, all these uh, in Parallel Studio, if you buy the, the whole package, then you get everything along with the technical support. If you want to uh, look for individual packages, then simply go on to um, the web and Google for the products. So in this case, I Googled for Intel Python, and it very quickly took me to a web page that says, choose and download, and you can choose to either have the commercial version or the community supported one. And that's true of all the individual products. Okay, let's uh, now move on to the, the piece of code that we're going to be working with, and it's the Mandelbrot application. And you can see from the, the screen that it's split, I split it into three functions. So it's, it's not a very complicated piece of code. Its main purpose is to keep the CPU busy so that we can show some of the techniques. So this is fairly standard Python. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by taking a sort of naive version of this code. And then I'm going to go through the steps to use something called Cython, introducing threads, then also you introduce the Intel compiler. And you'll see through these steps that the, the code gets uh, be optimized as we go through these steps. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna start by running the naive version. So in our application, I've got a um, separate folder and these folders will be, we can make this folder available with the code as well. So what I've got here is eight different uh, subdirectories which have got the different versions of the same code. So um, we're going to just step through a few of those. So I'll go into the, the naive one. Um, but what I should do is show you what I'm running on. So for those that are used to 
working in with high performance computing you, and, and are comfortable with Linux, you, you'll know that you can look at the CPU um, info. Now, it's a lot of nonsense that's come on the screen, but what we can see from here, I'm going to show you two things. First of all, that this particular machine I'm running on, I've, I've used an inst uh, a Linux instruction to give me, it's really saying, what processor am I using? What does it support? And there's two things we can see on this machine is that it's, um, it supports 22 cores. And actually, the CPU, it says here physical ID 1. Um, when this little tool that I use, uh, the um, RAM, it's just showing the output from a file, actually. Then um, it starts counting at zero. So what it means is that I'm running on a machine that's a two socket machine. There's two CPUs and each CPU um, has got 22 cores. OK, the other thing I want to show is that and again, it's, you can kind of ignore this level of detail, but it is of interest is that I'm looking at the instruction set. This is to do with vectorization, which we may talk about a little bit more later. And what we see is that we're supporting something called AVX 512. Now, if you remembered on my introduction at the beginning, I spoke about wide registers and I gave an example of a 128 bit register can support two doubles. Then this AVX 512, those registers are 512 bits wide rather than 128. So four bits, sorry, four times the size. So that means that they would, you better fit eight doubles into that register. Register. So within the code, if you had loops with lots and lots of calculations, combination of the compile and how the libraries work, you could get a speed up of 8x on for for uh, double calculations, for example. But anyway, that's just to show you the, the hardware I'm running on. And um, I'll show you a link later on of, of the exact machine I'm using. But let's stick with this. I'll just clear this screen again. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do is just run the first example. Let me just show you the content of the script file. I've already um, run these. Anyway, I'm, um, and I've got a backup on my laptop, but what we're doing is that we're just calling um, um, main.py, which in turn calls the Mandelbrot code. So let's um, do that. So it's nothing very exciting happening at the moment. It's generating a Mandelbrot pattern. We won't even look at the pattern. It's uh, not, it's, well, it is of interest, but not for what we're doing. So this is Python code. It's using the standard Python package. Um, and it, so it's, it's, at the moment, it's, it's an interpretive language. It's not running natively. And you can see here that it ran for 15 seconds. So what we're going to do is do some steps to get it faster and faster. What I'd like to do is, so that, there's the piece of uh, the example that we've done. Um, what I'd like to do is, is um, look at the profiling of that. So what I'm going to do is just show you, first of all, the profiling script. So this is calling VTune. So this ample xe-cl, that is a command line version of VTune. Now this machine I'm running on, I'm, I've, I'm connected remotely to it. So it's sitting in Swindon somewhere, actually, in an Intel office. So what I've done is I've, on this remote machine, I've run the uh, VTune collector and I've said, collect me the hotspots and just give me the, the command that I need to run. When I run that, then what that does is it generates a folder. And you can see the folder at the top. It's R000HS. I'm not going to run it again now because I, I did it just before the webinar. And what I'm going to do is I've copied the results onto my local laptop and I'm going to view the results on my laptop simply because it's easier um, to display in a webinar doing it this way. But you, you could do everything on the ro remote machine. But so what I'm going to do now is um, start up a um, the application. So let's, um, let's see if we can share. So what I'm doing is first of all, I'm showing you folder. Um, don't worry that you can't read everything in there. What I'm doing is I'm going to the results that I've copied earlier. And I go to the naive version. And 
I'm going to go to the version here. We need to share the new tool. Okay, so what this is doing is, so when I ran VTune, VTune launched the application, it did some performance profiling, and then um, what it then did was um, to package all the results. I've copied those results to my local laptop because it's easier for showing in a webinar. And I'm using VTune uh, also installed on my laptop. So you can install the collector on the remote machine and view it on a local machine. And I was, I just copied the files across. I literally got a copy of the, the whole directory structure on this machine. So what we see here is that um, it, VTune gives us um, uh, some hints. First of all, it says, you can see on the right-hand side here that the, the microarchitecture usage is about 60% and the vector usage is 6.3%. What I'm interested in is the parallelism. So this um, graph here is showing how parallel our code is. So the, the, this uh, middle line here, and if I put my line on it, it says um, we were using 36 cores at the same time, but we should be able to go much higher. Now, although it's saying it's parallel, the key thing here is that it ran for 30 seconds. That's, that's the important thing. So, and we could dig further into here. So we, if we went to the, to the bottom up, so this is showing the, the hotspots. I may have to browse for the to file itself. Um, let me just browse for it. Uh, say, okay, looking like it's found it. It's just loading the source file. So what VT is doing is matching the source file to the results it had. And what you see here is that my biggest hotspot um, is on this line of code. Now, um, um, I've actually pulled in the wrong source file, but um, it, it'd be fine. Let's, it, you get the idea that you can browse into um, source code. Let me go back now to, uh, let's, uh, what I'm going to do is to go on back to my slides for one minute and just show you a couple of things. So let's find my presentation. And there we are. Okay, so what I did was I ran the naive version and uh, I, I ran the script. So what the naive version did was generating a Mandelbrot. I just ran the, the run.sh. Um, the machine I'm running on was in a server actually provided by Intel. And this is the, the link for the details. It's one of the latest Xeon scalable processors, two socket system with Xeon Gold on them. And then what I did was I profiled it. And what the profiling did was I called the command line version. I collected the hotspots and it generated a folder. And that folder, I then copied it across to my local machine in order just to show the results in the GUI, okay? Then I showed you some example. This screenshot here in this slide is from when I ran it on an, an example on my laptop. And you can see it ran, ran in the order of 30 seconds. So, that's the starting point with Python code. What I want to do now in the next sort of 20 minutes or so is to go through some steps to make that code um, to be more optimized. Now, I think I'm going to give a spoiler right at the beginning. So I'm going to quickly uh, nip down, uh, uh, here we are, look. The, the, my full set of labs have got eight folders. We're not going to do all of them. But what happens is, is that we start off with the naive code we then start using something called Scython, which is a technique. It's, it's standard to Python distributions. It's not Intel specific. It's, uh, it's pretty mature technology. What Scython does is it takes the Python code and generates C code. And then you can do things with your Python code to influence how Scython is working. And uh, I'll show you the goals um, of those steps, but we go through doing some Scython, and then beyond that, I then look at um, adding some parallelism and then finally using the Intel compiler. So those are the steps we're going to go through. And as I say, I'm going to do a bit of uh, a spoiler. 
This is a set of uh, time versions. It's not actually on the machine we're running here. This is I did this on a um, on a on a different machine, but it was still a, 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 a latest generation. And in this particular example, my code started at 20 seconds, and I kept doing different optimizations. And right at the end, I got it running at 0.078 seconds. So you can see quite a bit of um, uh, speed up over the period. So let's um, go on to the example. So what I want to do now is to look at how the um, cycle works. I'm going to go back to my slide again. What happens with the uh, when you siphonize, there's a, a build system. And what you do is you change your Python code to be a, a PYX file. And you can see there I've, that mandelbrot.py, I just simply changed it to PYX and then provide provided another file. This setup.py is pretty standard. If you Google anywhere, this will be a fairly standard uh, recipe that you use as a build system. And then when it's called, what the siphon does is it generates a C file. So you see on step one, it generates a mandelbrot.c. And then the build system uses the compiler on the machine to compile that code and produces a shared object. And it's the, it's the shared object that's run natively on, on, the, um, on your server or workstation. So those are the particular steps. And when you do that, um, what will happen is, is that um, there'll be a, a set of uh, HTML files that are produced that give you some hints as to where the bottlenecks are. So that's what I want to show you now. So what I'm going to do now is just go back to the, um, the demo itself. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to the, the first Cython version. Okay. And what this has done, so let's just clear the screen so you can see what's in there. All you can see, if you look, that there is the mandelbrot.pyx. If I cat mandelbrot.pyx, you'll see, and I'll just quickly scroll up, it's this, exactly the same code. I haven't changed it. All I've changed is the extension, nothing else at all. And then um, previously when I ran the Python code on the naive one, I simply ran the Python code I called python name.py. Now that we're doing siphonizing, there is an additional build step. So let me just cap the um, build uh, script. And um, what you see here is that what the script does is I'm just deleting some intermediate files, the, the, the generated file. And then um, what I'm doing is I'm building the um, calling setup.py. Okay. And then what I'm also doing, I'm asking Cython to generate an annotated file. This is what this call is doing. And uh, you'll see what, what the purpose of that is in a moment. So let's just quickly run the build. And what you should notice is that there are some steps. So what it's doing is it's uh, generated the C code. So you see at the top, there's a message here that said Cythonizing Mandelbrot. And then the second thing it does is it then calls GCC, and that's to do the compilation. So, and then finally, so it produces an object file. And then as a final step, it then uses that object file to create um, this uh, shared object. Okay. And then when you run that, we might as well just run it on here anyway. Um, let's, so I've made no changes to the code. Uh, let's see how long it ran for, runs for this time. Don't know if you remembered last time, I think it ran. I'd, so this time it's run for eight seconds. Um, the first one, although I didn't run it live, I ran it before the webinar. It, the, the previous one ran for 30 seconds, but now it, it runs for eight seconds simply by using the siphonizing. And then and what you can do is you can use VTune to have a look at, well, what's the difference? So let's see if I can load those results. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call the GUI from here, actually, and then we'll use X11 forwarding to see the results. So I'm going Amplify GUI, and then I'm giving it the name of the file. Okay. And 
that should just run. It's going to take a, a short while to load up. Okay, and while it's doing that, um, I can now share that. So let me go on to the, get the right application. Okay, so what we see here is that um, when I, um, it says here that the elapsed time was, that's the, the wall clock time, nine, just under 10 seconds. But what you see is that the total thread count is one. So we're still running uh, serially, basically. So there's no parallelism. Although we've done use Scython, then um, it's not introduced any parallelism. What it's done is it's taken some of the Python code, which was originally all interpreted code, and it's replaced it by generating C code. And then the C code runs much faster, but that C code is still calling into the Python API. And that's that's the part where it's still not running as fast as it could. So yet yeah, we we're three times faster already than the, using the, na the naive Python version. But we've we've we're still not running parallel, and we still have a number of uh, bottlenecks. Now, when you do the siphonizing, it generates um, a HTML file, and I'm going to try and load that up now. So what you see here is that there. Are, some yellow lines, and it helpfully says at the top, yellow lines hint at Python interaction. And it's this Python interaction, so the C code at these points, so this is the original Python code we've written, and, um, but what the siphonizer does, it, it spots where the Python APIs are being called, and that's expensive. And the goal when you're doing siphonizing is to get rid of the yellow lines. Now, you may not be a C programmer, and it's C programming, you don't need to be a C programmer to do this. If you're interested in the C, and maybe I shouldn't do this now because it will put you off using this, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, but you can see the raw output, and you can see here that that's, it's really lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of, um, I would, um, it would be very rare that you'd even need to really look at this. Okay, but so let's go back to the, uh, the Python code. So, so the goal is, is to add additional parts that you can put in your Python code to get rid of these yellow parts. So let, let me show you that in the slide. So I'm going to go back to the presentation, go down a few slides. You saw the GCC being called. Uh, so we, this is a different versions. I did a spoiler early on and showed you the sort of optimizations. We've just looked at the naive one naive Python and naive Scython. What we then do is add something, uh, some C depth. So we annotate the code, and I'm going to show you an example. This is the example where we're actually going to be putting some threading code, but the concept is the same. Can you see that I've got within the Python code a C def statement? And these C def statements, this is telling the Scythonizer these variables underneath, or these pieces of code, uh, treat them as C code, so convert them. If the C def wasn't there, these would be treated as Python variables and there'd be calls to the Python API inserted in there. So the step of Scythonizing, having generated the first version of your Scython code, the goal then will be to go through your uh, different code and start adding C defs. Let me see if I can um, show you an example of that. Okay, so what we've got here is, um, where the original um, variables, Python variables were, in this case, I've added two things. I've given information about the type of the variable, where it must be once it's converted into C, and I've put a declaration there that says C def. So the addition of C def and int tells the Scythonizer that um, use C code for these and not Python APIs. Okay, what I'm going to do now in the next few minutes, I'm going to skip on to the next two sections. One is, is adding parallel code to the example, and then the second thing is in, uh, adding the Intel compiler. So um, let me go back to my slides just to show you the steps. What I've said is that when you deal with Scython, then the goal is to get rid of the yellow by adding C defs into your code. In this example, in my screen, you can see at the top there are C defs uh, um, in the uh, top part, so there's more work still to be done, but that's the step of 
if you see lines 11, 12, and 13, if you can manage to see that, then that C def block, none of those are yellow because those are being converted straight into C variables. But you don't need to look at the C code. As I said, you can just deal with that. So what I'm going to do now is to look at adding the threaded code. And so this is looking at now the parallelism part. And what you can see here is that, as I said at the beginning um, of when we were talking about Python, it's the global interpreter lock serializes Python code. So, but what you can do is within Cython, you can get a piece of part of your the code in the PYX file and add this with no gear or no Jill. And that tells the Cythonizer not to, to, to disable the global uh, inter, um, interpreter lock for that block. Now, it will only work if that block has got no yellow in it. In other words, it, it mustn't have any calls to the Python API. So, and Cython will give you an error message if you put that there and there's still some Python APIs. So the way you do it from a technique is you, you look at your report from Cython, you'd get the block that you're interested in making parallel, make sure that there are no yellow parts, no calls to the API, and then you put with, with no gill. And that will result in that piece of code being made parallel. And the way that it does it, this is the generator code from that same build. And you can see that they've added uh, OpenMP. OpenMP is a pragma-based language for adding parallelism to C code. So what Cython has done is take your Python code, it's Cythonized it, it's spotted the with no gill, and in there it's inserted in the generated C code um, some OpenMP pragmas that says this piece of code, which is translated into a C loop, make this parallel share the loops across the different cores. What I'm going to do now is to, um, let's hopefully, let's see if I can um, get the results of that loaded. So what I'm going to do is I now need to share a different application again. Let's go back. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to the parallel version Let's see if this will work. P07. Right. Now, because once you've made the code parallel, um, then um, what happens is that it ends up being there's not enough work for those parallel sections to do anything. So what we can do is we can cheat. So in our source files, we've got a thing called settings. Uh, uh, come on, let's get it right. Settings.py. And this has got a thing called factor. In the previous examples, we got that factor as being one. So right in the naive version of both Python site beginning, everything was one. And this is just a multiplier on the loops that's generating the Mandelbrot. So in order to make the code do substantially more work so we can see what it's doing, then what I've done is I've um, increase that by 100. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run this code. It's already been built with a factor of 100. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you live the profiling. So I'm going to go to another window, which is running something called HTOP, which shows the parallel. It's just a command line tool that comes with Linux. So let me, so let's see if we can get this going properly. So I'm going to share this with you. Now, what we've got there is that we've got uh, an entry for every core. So the two sockets, uh, two socket system, and we've got a total of, of, of 88 um, hardware threads can be supported. So what, while you're watching that, what I'm going to do is run the parallel examples. So this is the one where we've added the, the with no kill. So, and I'm running it, and what you see is that all the cores are running at 100%. Now, if I did that with the original, the earlier versions of the Python code, you'd only see one core running. Or you might see two or three if there's some libraries involved. But, but what we see now is by adding uh, that particular uh, no gill, then you can see that we're taking full advantage of the cores. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out of there ever so quickly and go back to the slides. Uh, and we're 
coming to the point of winding up where I want to show you. So let's go back. The last thing is to use the Intel compiler. When, you, when we did the Scython, it used the default compiler, which is GCC on the system, the GNU C compiler. Um, what you can do is that you can uh, change some variables. And what it will do is it will use the Intel compiler, in this case, rather than GCC. And so I've done that in the parallel version. Uh, or if you're using it on Windows, and those are the environment variables that you would set. Um, and then what I'm going to do is to run that same version now using the Intel compiler. So let's go back to, uh, let me share with you my example. Uh, remember, I changed it, the, this factor up to X100. Yeah, so I'm running a hundred times uh, more than the naive version. So what I'm doing is I'm coming out of the parallel version. Notice the parallel version ran for 66 seconds, approximately. I'm going now into the version that um, is using the Intel compiler. I'll just count the, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. let's do an LS, see what's in there. So um, what we have here is if I count the run script, um, you can see the run script does exactly um, the same thing. Let's do a cat on the build. Um, see, when we built it, what I then do is to say, so this is the part that where it's calling the Scython, uh, Scythonize, and I'm setting three environment variables at the beginning. Um, so it's then going to use the Intel compiler rather than using GCC. Now, I'm not going to run the build, but what, I'm not going to build it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to result, uh, build the actual um, the executable that we ran. So let's um, just remind you what the so you want me to clear the screen so you can see the top. OK, remember, that's the run script. So I'm still doing Python main.py, which in turn, because of our site and build system, ends up calling the um, optimized version. So what I've got here now is I've got both parallel, uh, the no gil in there, and also I've now switched to the Intel compiler. And I've again, the settings, let's just do the, uh, is now at 100, OK? So it's the same as when we just had the no gil. So let's um, run that and see what happens. Um, I think I can drag my other screen across. Oh, you can see. OK, yeah, it works. You can see we're still running at 100%. So we're running on all 88 threads. And I'll go back to the other screen. Uh, there it is. Let's see how long it took. And now you see that um, previously it took. Anyway, so here it ran for 27 seconds on this case. Let me let me do one final thing, just my own sanity. Let's go back to the, the 07 one um, and just run that again. I've forgotten what the figure was. This time it's 27 seconds. Now we're on the parallel one. And this is the final thing that I want to do. While that's running, um, I'm going to now just pull up the last two slides and then we'll come back to that result unless it comes up while I'm about to share. On my slides, I put, uh, uh, you won't read that now, but if you get a copy of the slides, you better see that I put uh, results of all the different runs of the different steps. So what have we seen today? Well, Python can be parallel, and there's different kinds of parallelism that Python could take advantage of. In our case, we were just doing threading and vectorization, but in one of the future webinars, we'll look also at how to get the Python running across clusters. The tools that I've used, I've used the Intel uh, optimized libraries and also uh, BT for profiling. I've also used the Intel compiler for this last step as well. So you have a choice of using the commercial version. Uh, if you want to use the Intel compiler, you have to get the commercial version anyway. If you need support, you get the commercial. But also parts of those tools are available as a community supported version. So we looked at Scython. Next time, we'll look at some other techniques for making code parallel. And then as a final step, I just to tell you, I've got the original results. I won't share the screen again yet. Yeah, with the no gil, it took 65 seconds. 
But once we flipped to the Intel compiler, it took half that time, 27 seconds. So you can see the effect of just swapping the compiler. And what I'd like to do in another webinar later on is to do some more analysis of well, what is it that the Intel compiler brought to that particular build? And I also want to look at different techniques for making code parallel. And with that, I go on to the any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. That's that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to open up to the floor now if anyone's got um, anything they'd like to ask. Um, just give people a second if they want to type anything in there. Well, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. So what we can do is if anyone has any additional questions um, licensing wise, um, please feel free to contact Grey Matter um, and speak to myself. That's Daniel Payton. Or if they've got any other questions, um, I'm sure Stephen, we can work out a way of them contacting you. We can yeah. pass on the information. So to those attendees, we'll, we can send through a copy of the recording in the next few days, um, and there'll be links to useful resources and other events and webinars we've got coming up. Um, obviously, the, the other webinars in this series, we can arrange later dates for that. Okay, thanks, Stephen, and thanks to everyone else. Okay, thank you, and uh, uh, good day, everyone.